To get started, let's return to the financial forecasting framework introduced in the last session. In the previous session, we worked on forecasting the income statement by forecasting revenues down to EBIT or operating profit. Now it's time to move to the balance sheet, where we'll explore how to model operating assets, such as property plan and equipment, accounts receivable, inventories, and accounts payable. At this stage, we are not aiming to forecast the entire balance sheet. Having forecast the revenues and costs of an operation, the next step is to consider forecasting the operating assets required to generate them. We will leave all finance-related items on the balance sheet for later. Right now, we are only going to forecast operating NOD current assets, accounts receivable, inventories, and accounts payable. We start with modeling property, plant, and equipment, or PP&E. But before we begin to forecast, there are the same two approaches to consider here, as were explained in the first module, the first principles approach and the quick and dirty approach. Applying the first principles approach here identifies how you'd go about modeling PP&E if you need a high degree of detail and precision. The quick and dirty approach outlines how you can model property, plant, and equipment in a much more straightforward way with the benefit that your model will be smaller as well as easier to follow and audit. The other benefit of using the quick and dirty approach is that linking PP&E to revenues ensures that as revenues grow, PP&E also grows. For our case study, we're going to use the quick and dirty approach, using historic figures and trends to predict future growth. In more complex forecasts, we may need to break down property, plant, and equipment. In order to do this easily within a model, the best approach is to put the property, plant, and equipment breakdown in a separate note or schedule. If you recall from the first module, we put all of our supporting schedules in a separate section to again keep our building blocks for inputs, processing, and outputs separate. Breaking down the calculation will allow us to identify forecast acquisitions and disposals which are necessary to complete a cash flow forecast. When forecasting property, plan, and equipment from first principles, we typically start with forecasting acquisitions and disposals and then work down to the property, plan, and equipment net book value. When forecasting using a quick and dirty approach, we do the reverse. We start with property, plan, and equipment net book value and work upwards to get acquisitions and disposals. You will see this firsthand in the case study. Disposals can be forecast based on the historic relationship between the gross cost of opening property, plant, and equipment and the gross cost of disposals. Now that we've worked through our property, plant, and equipment, let's turn to forecasting working capital. A first principles approach to forecasting working capital typically involves forecasting individual current assets and current liabilities using various working capital ratios such as receivable days, inventory days, and payable days. Our forecast model will use this approach. Alternatively, we could calculate working capital as one item in a quick and dirty way based on historic trends. Cash, although often considered part of working capital, will be forecasted as a financing item later. The first working capital item that we will forecast is accounts receivable. The accounts receivable days ratio is often used to link forecast receivables to revenue. The first formula seen here defines the accounts receivable days ratio. The second formula shows how we can use forecast sales and receivable days to forecast receivables. After forecasting receivables, we can then forecast accounts payable. In a similar manner, the accounts payable days ratio can be used to link forecast payables to cost of sales. 
if cost of sales data is not available, revenues can be used. The first formula seen here defines the accounts payable days ratio. The second formula shows how we can use forecast cost of sales and payable days to forecast accounts payable. The last working capital item to forecast is inventory. The inventory days ratio can be used to link forecast inventories to cost of sales. Once again, if cost of sales data is not available, revenues can be used. The first formula seen here defines the inventory days ratio. The second formula shows how we can use forecast cost of sales and inventory days to forecast inventories. Forecasting the finance structure impacts both the balance sheet and the income statement. Forecasting equity requires forecasting stock issuance and stock repurchases, as well as forecasting changes in retained earnings. Retained earnings changes will be largely driven by our forecasted net income and dividends. As an aside, when forecasting retained earnings changes in our model, we will complete a retained earnings supporting schedule section. Much like we used a note to forecast PP&E in the previous module. Forecasting debt requires forecasting both short-term and long-term debt, as well as the associated interest costs. Once we've completed our financing forecast, we can complete the cash section, thereby completing the balance sheet. In short, cash is determined simply as the balancing figure in the balance sheet. There are many practical modeling issues that need to be considered when forecasting the finance structure. A useful question to ask at the start is whether you need to use a target leverage figure in your model. In other words, do you need to forecast debt levels as a multiple of equity? If the answer is no, consider using opening debt to calculate interest and assume that long-term debt is constant. This will keep your model simple and straightforward. More importantly, it will minimize the chance of getting circular references. Our financial model case study uses this simple approach. However, if you need to use target leverage figures in your model, the next question to ask is, what level of precision is required in modeling the financing structure? Do you need to go down the high complexity route and model debt and equity issuance from first principles? If so, you will inevitably generate circular references that need to be solved. We will look at solutions for circular references later in this session. The halfway point is to build your model with an intermediate level of complexity where leverage ratios are used to calculate debt and opening debt is used to calculate interest.